Welcome to lesson two of the Legal and Financial Essentials course of the nonprofit bootcamp e-learning series. Digging into the various legal, accounting, and financial aspects of your business is critical to success, yet it can also be intimidating, especially for smaller nonprofit organizations. This course will cover the basics of legal and accounting, as well as more specialized accounting issues in an understandable way, helping you to action out your legal to-dos with confidence. You will we will cover fiduciary responsibility, accounting requirements, and issues that are specific to nonprofits working with food. Today's lesson, Accounting Basics, will cover minimum accounting requirements, systems, and budgets. Today's presenter is Poppy Davis. Poppy teaches and advises on business and policy issues affecting family scale farms and ranches and related associations. She is the Director of Entrepreneurship at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas School of Law and consults for farm programs across the country. Previously, she was the National Program Leader for Small Farms and Beginning, ranchers, and beginning Farmers and Ranchers at the USDA and prior to that at California CPA. She holds a Juris Doctor from Drake University Law School, a Master's in Journalism from Georgetown, and a BS in Agricultural Economics from the University of California, Davis. Poppy, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. There we go. What we're going to cover today are basic systems requirements for an, a small nonprofit and a not that small nonprofit. One of the things we're gonna learn is that even the smallest nonprofit has pretty complex accounting requirements. And that's really the heart and soul of what makes this difficult. Everybody wants simple, plain, easy to read financial reports from nonprofits, but they're just complicated. And so we're gonna walk through a framework for you to start to think about what your needs are for your organization and how to meet them. So your needs for your accounting system are multi-layered, and the way you meet them is through one integrated system. So the board, we talked about last time, we talked about board uh, fiduciary responsibility for the organization. So it's critical that board members have accounting reports that they can understand and that they're trained so that they can understand those reports. And it's really important that the board see consistent and standardized reports and not Every single time they sit to a board meeting, everything looks totally different because the organization is still figuring it out. Inside of the organization as managers, you have certain managerial accounting needs that are at a level probably more detailed than what the board needs. Uh, first and foremost among those for more so, most organizations is, manage, is a cash flow. How to manage cash flow if that's uncertain, how to project how far out you might be really running out of cash and needing to make important decisions. Your funders have very specific grant reporting requirements, and that's really grant and contract reporting requirements. So if you bill on contract, there's a certain set of information you have to do, you have to have in order to send out a bill and get paid. And if you have grants that want financial reports, you have to comply with your funders' expectations. So all of those things have to be incorporated into your setup. Also, of course, the IRS has specific accounting requirements. And then you'll need to look at the realistic capacity of your organization to meet these needs. What's your internal capacity? What can you outsource? And then finally, we'll discuss whether or not you're gonna want an audit, if you're required to have an audit, and what alternatives there may be to an audit. So in terms of board reporting expectations, the board wants to see a balance sheet. They may not know they want to see a balance sheet, but they do need to see a balance sheet and they need to be trained to read a balance sheet if that's not a skill that they already have. They should see a profit and loss or income statement. P&L, income statement, profit and loss, those are all the same thing. Um, that's a statement that shows income and expense for that period. They really don't need to see that monthly. Quarterly is probably adequate. Less than that is probably not, um, I'm sorry, less frequently, right? So if they only see it once a year, that's often, that's not often enough. Monthly is probably too often. Quarterly is probably about right. And you should probably try to plan your board meetings 
so that they happen about a month after the close of the financial quarter so that everybody can be in a routine of having a quarterly financial package ready for the board about 30 days from the close of the third month of the quarter. The board is supposed to look at an annual budget and approve it, but they're also going to want to look at how the organization is tracking to that budget. So in addition to the budget, they should see on a quarterly basis the budget to actual performance. So that would usually be that quarterly P&L presented in a way that you can see it in comparison to the budget. And then for most organizations, the board should be looking at cash flow projections. There are very few organizations that are so flush with cash that they don't want to be able to see several months, six to 12 months into the future for when the organization might be out of cash to have a sense of urgency of fundraising or perhaps the need to cut back on expenses, most critically payroll. If you're gonna to have to lay someone off or cut someone's time back, you wanna have as long an event horizon as possible to see that coming. Um, most important thing in all of the board reporting expectations is readability. The way to get readability is to follow standard formats and test some packages and then stick with it and not keep changing it around on the board. That's the biggest complaint I hear from board members is that they no sooner get used to a board package than it changes. The, not saying don't change your board packet if it isn't a good board packet right now, but definitely the goal should be to get to a set packet, a set way of presenting things, and then try to stick with it. On the managerial side, cash flow, cash flow king. The second most important thing managers are gonna be concerned with are cost allocation. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. That's really the hardest thing in nonprofit accounting is that you have different programs, different funding sources, and employees who work across the different programs and different funding sources and other shared costs. And it's very difficult to figure out um, an accurate and efficient way of allocating shared costs between programs and funding sources. Grant and contract reporting closely related. Those funding sources want you to report on their program. The organization as a whole will, for example, run one payroll but that payroll may touch on multiple programs and activities. And so you need the cost allocation strategy to be able to report to those grants and contracts with the costs that were incurred as a single item, right? A single paycheck goes out, but that paycheck could end up hitting 20 or more easily different components of the organization in terms of different programs and different funding sources that fund those programs. The other big managerial accounting need is a system of internal controls. So we spoke last week about ethics and good being good financial stewards of the organization's resources. The way to do that most of the time is to have a system of internal controls that ensures that no unauthorized transactions get through the system, that no inaccurate transactions get through the system, or if in a worst case scenario, either of those things does happen, it's still promptly discovered and corrected. That's a simple way of describing a system of internal control. Actually putting a system into place could easily take you a year. And once you have a system of internal controls, it's a matter of continual training and maintenance to make sure that that system truly reflects the needs of the organization. Budgets and budget to actual documents at the program level are where most organizational managers are gonna be operating. So everything I've been talking about so far is the realm of the executive director and the chief financial officer. The program managers themselves just beg to see an accurate budget for their program, an accurate year-to-date budget to actual reports. That's their number one need. Um, so a system that delivers that to managers so that managers are not frustrated and are able to do their job. As much as possible to have staff participate in that so the budget and budget to actual are not fully and only the domain of managers, but more junior staff can start to participate in that process and understand why the process is important to every aspect of the organization. 
for grant reporting requirements, one of the things that goes wrong with small nonprofits that are building a new accounting system from the ground up is they tend to build it around grant reporting requirements first because that seems like the first uh, specific thing that they've been asked for, right? The funder gives the money and they know they have to report and they build the system at that level. Um, it, it's an understandable strategy, but what tends to happen when the system is built at that level is it becomes almost impossible to meet those higher summarized needs that the managers and the board have. Um, but certainly it's not any better to do it the other way where you meet the summarized needs of the board and the managers and you don't meet the needs of the funders. All of these needs need to be addressed. So the grant reporting requirements are at the funding level. And we're gonna talk a lot more about the difference between a program and the funding sources that fund the program. Which is again the common error that small nonprofits make is they equate a funding source with a program. So the grant reporting requirements are at the funding source level, which is a level lower than the program. And a key thing that can trip a lot of people up with their capacity when they're looking to buy an accounting system <clears throat> is the grant reporting period maybe for a totally different period of time than the fiscal year of the organization. So let's just say that the organization is on a June to June fiscal year. The funder could be on a calendar year and require you to report on the calendar year, which is six months off from the fiscal year. Shouldn't be a problem, but you do need to check that the system you put in place has that capacity. Funder may also fund you for an odd period of time. It may be an 18 month or a 24 month grant. So you have to have that ability to track that funding source over some strange period of time that doesn't align with the normal time periods that you use for your normal financial and managerial accounting. Other thing that is really tricky for organizations to develop a discipline around is that when you write your application, either for grant or contract funding, you're writing for the funder's financial reporting category. It's extremely unlikely those will ever match up with what your internal financial reporting categories are. So usually there's some sort of a need to do a crosswalk back and forth between the categories the funders use and the categories that you're using and the mistake people make is they keep adding new, new reporting categories into their overall financial system to try to address the needs of any one funder. And then they end up with a very, very, very long list of categories for their organization and a great deal of confusion about, um, you know, is it supplies or materials? Those kinds of questions, which shouldn't occupy a whole lot of time once you've decided what your internal definitions for things like that are. But every time you do a new grant application or contract application, that organization is going to probably be using some slightly different terminology than you're using. So that's built into the system as a way to make sure that that gets aligned from the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about what the IRS requires. They require at a minimum that you be able to separate administrative activities, development activities, and program activities. So that's three areas of the organization that the IRS wants you to report. So if you think of your income and expense items, think of them at a minimum as appearing in three columns for the IRS. Um, this is basic. This is a basic requirement. It's still not met by many organizations because the organizations haven't thought through a strategy for how to allocate, for example, the executive director's salary between administration, development, and programs. Uh, usually in a small organization, development kind of happens everywhere and there's not a lot of discrete expenses that are obviously charged to development. And if the organization isn't on the ball in understanding why it's important to have a decent budget for development, the tax return will end up showing that the organization has spent very little money on development. That's not actually a good thing because that tells a funder 
that you're not investing in fundraising activities. That's not actually what the funder wants to see. We'll talk more about the public role of your tax returns um, in this session and next week in the next session. The other thing the IRS asks you to do is break out your largest program. So you want to have the ability not to have, if you have more than one program, you want to be able to present your largest program separately on your tax return. You have to be able to show the salaries of officers and other top earners separate from other salaries in the organization. You need to be able to track related party transactions. That kind of goes back to an ethics issue, but that's an IRS requirement and there are definitions for who are related parties. It doesn't mean you can't have related party transactions. It means the IRS may scrutinize them more. And we'll talk about that more next week. You need to be able to track different types of income according to the categories that the IRS is looking at membership income, donation income, contract and grant income, investment income, which is different from those kinds of incomes, special events and fee for service, they're looking at for sure for what's called the unrelated business income tax. And we will talk about that some more so that you have a clear understanding of what it is and when you may face it and how to plan around it. In terms of systems capacity, you need to be able to track and report for different programs. You could call the programs in an accounting sense when you're looking at an accounting program. They may be called programs, they may be called enterprises. In QuickBooks, they're called classes. But when you're looking for an accounting program, it has to have the capacity to track at that level. You also need to be able to track and report for different funding sources and understand that that's two different levels of accounting and they may not be in a one-to-one -one relationship. As I mentioned before, reporting across flexible time periods. You need the capacity in the system to do journal entries. Any standard accounting system will have this capacity, um, but any made-up system such as in Excel will not have a journal entry capacity. And you want to be able to export your reports to Excel, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. But those are basic IT requirements from the system you would look at. With respect to whether or not you get a financial audit, <clears throat> there's a federal audit requirement under OMB 133, that's federal standard for federal audit, or not a federal audit, it's a federal standard for when you need an audit if you have received more than half a million in federal funds. I'll talk about that in more detail next week. You may be required to get a financial audit simply because a funder requests slash requires it or because a bank requires it as terms for giving you a bank loan. The board may simply come to a decision that they want a financial audit. Not an unreasonable decision at all, but certainly a decision that comes with a cost. So it is important that the board understands that an audit is not the only game in town. Um, you could, as an alternative to an audit, get a lower level review from a certified public accountant, and that would be a review or a compilation, or having the accountant just review the internal controls of the organization as a cost-saving measure that still provides some external oversight, but doesn't cost as much and isn't as time-consuming. I'll talk about all of these things in more detail later. So in terms of internal capacity, one of the things to think about is like who's going to actually be doing this. So a bookkeeper is sort of the minimum capacity you would need. And then the question is, is this bookkeeper going to be an employee of the organization or their own, they're their own company, they operate as a bookkeeper and you're one of their clients? There's no right answer there. That's just a matter of how many transactions you have really. How many transactions a week is a really good indicator of how much time you're going to need from a bookkeeper. In terms of the experience the bookkeeper needs to have, it really makes a difference if the bookkeeper has an AA degree in accounting. Uh, those degrees are, are very meaningful, very useful, and most colleges that offer those degrees really do a good job of training bookkeepers in the basics of accounting. Um, this is a basic understanding of the accounting formula, which is debits and credits. They are not fully avoidable when you're deep in the 
uh, detailed requirements of nonprofit accounting. And they need to have a good grasp of the basic definitions of assets, liabilities, net assets, income, and expense. They could be self-trained. They don't have to have an AA. But if this is someone who doesn't have an AA and is self-trained, then you would want to see quite substantial work experience under the supervision of people who had formally studied accounting. And then you would have someone who had learned all the same things. But the, what I'm saying is you really don't want to hire a bookkeeper who's totally going to make it up by reading the QuickBooks manual. Unlikely to get you where you need to know because nonprofit accounting is really always has some complexity to it. And as we discussed under ethics, there's a lot of external people that are relying on the quality of this information. So once you get past having your needs met through a bookkeeper, either in-house or someone that comes in once a week or once a month, the next level up would be to get a controller or a chief financial officer, someone who is definitely in-house full-time in a larger organization, they may be overseeing a bookkeeper, that bookkeeper may still be full-time or full -time or uh, not, it depends on what your need is. But at that level, you have a full-time person who definitely has an AA or perhaps even a four-year degree in accounting in a large organization. They would probably be a former CPA or still active CPA. Um, they would have a good understanding of allocations and audits and some of the detailed requirements of not-for-profit accounting. The important thing when you think about how to set up your system is that you want a carefully curated chart of accounts. We're going to talk more about what that means. But what it means for sure is people don't just add new accounts to the system whenever they feel like it. It's a closed system. You've come up with, you've made decisions about how your chart of accounts looks and you pretty much lock it in and just review it annually. If you need to make changes during the year, there's a pretty serious process to come up with a justification for why you would make a change. One of the problems that QuickBooks causes small organizations is it's so easy to make changes on the fly that, um, and especially when the bookkeeper isn't in close contact with other people, um, they, they, it's just so easy to make stuff up as they go that you very quickly move from a simple system to a system with many, many, many categories and a lot of complexity. And that's how you get reports that are too complicated to read. Programs, same thing. And this is the other place that the pre-planning is so important and the common mistake that young nonprofits make is that they don't make sure that there's a process that formally aligns the program as expressed to the public and as funded and as the program managers perceive them with the programs that are described in the accounting system and as the person in charge of entering the financial tra transactions perceives the program. So that needs to be aligned and locked in. That usually happens during the budget process. <clears throat> and then it does not change during the year unless there's a conversation among many people and an agreement that that's an appropriate change. <clears throat> Closely related, you need to have a, a discussion among several people to understand which funding sources require separate reporting. Not every funding source does require separate reporting. So you don't want to do a whole lot of unnecessary work, but you also want to make sure you set it up from the beginning that you do the required reporting. Backing all of this up is an accounting policies and procedures manual. This should be a living document. It could take months and months to create. It could take more than a year to really have it up and running. Once you get it up and running, it needs to be reviewed and, an, and updated annually because it really should be a current accurate reflection of how things work. Idea being if anybody was ever sick and needed to be gone for an extended period of time, someone who could read and was basically proficient could step right in and pick that up again. So when you think about an accounting procedures manual, um, think about the distinction between policy and procedure. The policy is a statement of what should be, and it could come from the board, the executive director, or the controller, depending on what level of uh, decision it is. But the procedure is the step-by-step -step guidance on how to comply with the policy. 
So when you're building your accounting policy and procedures manual, you need to be thinking about both. The board doesn't need to know what the procedure looks like. They just need to know that there is a procedure. The person executing the procedure does need to have an idea of the policy that the procedure is designed to execute. So here's some examples. Of, it's policy, everybody gets paid, right? That's not in question, but that is a policy. The procedure is how you actually run payroll. And that would be at the level of like logins and passwords and where the copies are kept and all the very minute detail of how to do that. It's a policy that the executive director should review and sign the bank account within 15 days of the close of the month. I put this in here because if you get nothing else out of this, this really is a core policy you should all have in place. It's a minimum oversight uh, policy. The procedure would be for the bookkeeper how to prepare that bank reconciliation and, it, and, and in detail of how in, inside of your organization, how that's prepared, where it's filed, how and when it comes to the ED. And then for the ED, the ED may not necessarily start out knowing what it means to review a bank reconciliation. So there's a procedure there that walks the ED through that, that action. The hardest one is managers reviewing budget to actual reports. When you get here, you kind of know you've arrived. You know you have a pretty robust system and you've pushed it all the way down to the level of management that really matters. The procedure is how those managers are going to review those budget to actual reports. Lots and lots of managers, when you first present this to them, that it's their job to do this monthly review, will say, oh, my goodness, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to read financial statements. Um, that's okay, we're gonna give you a detailed step-by-step -step procedure so that you will know how to do this. So the key thing on internal capacity is engaging staff and management as much as possible and as early as possible in developing budgets, approving expenses, preparing invoices, and doing a monthly review. Um, it, it's inevitable that the bookkeeper, whoever's doing the transactions, will have some questions and make some errors. And so there has to be a timely procedure for someone to catch those errors or answer those questions so that they don't pile up and create a lot of work at the end of the year or inaccurate reports during the year. The quarterly package to the board is a really great check on whether or not the monthly procedures are happening. So totally common, everybody's running short staff, do you get behind on some of your monthly review? But the the financial package is going to the board for the board meeting and the board meeting happens one month after the close of every quarter and so that's a time when people up their game and they finish doing the things they maybe didn't do during the month and they get those uh, reviews done so that the financials that go to the board have been have been seen by people at lower levels within the organization and checked for um, at least a superficial read on accuracy so the board's going to want to see the balance sheet and the income statement, the year-to-date budget to actual, which is the same exact report that the managers are looking at. The, the managers are looking at it for their program. The board is probably looking at it for the organization as a whole. But obviously, you don't want to disconnect between those two things. The board has what we call a roll-up, which is all the subparts rolled up into the one big summary, right? So you want people to have looked at all those subparts before you look at the summary report and see if it makes sense. And then as I mentioned before, month by month cash flow projections, probably a good 12 months out, um, probably quarterly if, um, you, I'm sorry, you wanna see 12 months out as standard. If the organization truly doesn't have cash flow issues, it would be okay to have it for a shorter period of time, but there wouldn't necessarily be any reason to do it for a shorter period of time. So the key, so let's talk now quickly about the IT capacity. So this is which accounting program you're going to purchase and how you're going to make the decision which program you're going to go with. So the functionality has to include enterprise or cost accounting and job costing. Those are two different things. The budgeting and cash flow management, it's really better off in Excel for most affordable programs. So um, it's great if you can afford a higher-end program, 
But if you can't, don't try to ask too much of the more affordable program. Budgeting and cash flow isn't hard to do in Excel. It's appropriate to do in Excel. The allocations, same way. It's the biggest problem. The most expensive programs do allocations really well, and they do them automatically. But it requires quite a bit of knowledge and sophistication to set up the automatic allocation. So there's no way a tiny organization is going to have the capacity and the money to buy one of these bigger systems with the automated allocation, program the automated allocation, and then also be able to change those automated programmed allocations from time to time as staff changes, as staff rates changes, as new funding sources come in. So if you're going to go with that bigger system, you're also basically locking in the need for a bookkeeper with advanced training. So one thing to consider for sure, if you're working in a community where you know there's not a lot of capacity just within the community and having an AA degree is a big deal and there aren't a lot of bookkeepers and hiring someone might take months, you probably don't want to lock in the kind of system that would be almost impossible to hire for. It makes more sense to lock in a simpler system, even though it does ultimately require more hours to get through some of the things you need to do, but you can get through them in a simpler way. So that's a that's a decision that is critical and it's going to be totally specific to your organization's capacity. Let's just talk about QuickBooks because that's where most people end up. Um, there's plenty of flaws. It there's a lot of workarounds. The workarounds are time consuming, but they're simple. If someone helps you set up the workarounds, then really almost anybody can follow behind follow closely with the accounting procedures manual and get you almost everything you would ever need between QuickBooks and Excel working together. And I've seen very large, very complicated organizations sort of maxing out the far end of QuickBooks capacity, but they're large and complex organizations and they are functioning within QuickBooks. Sage, AccuFund, and FundEZ, there's no question they're superior programs. There's no question they will save you time and get you better reports, and it's much, much more efficient. But it's just not optional to run those programs unless you can afford to hire and keep someone who's also at that caliber. They have to have strong accounting background and strong database management knowledge and be um, able to think through kind of complex logical problems and set up these automated allocations, customized reports, et cetera. This is the time to hire a CPA. If you're thinking about all these questions about setup, that's something that you may do maybe a few times at most in your life, set up a whole accounting system from scratch for a nonprofit. But a CPA who specializes in nonprofits basically does this all the time. So they're expert in the setup, in, in walking you through what I'm talking you through right now, how to understand the best fit for your need and then getting you going and getting you trained. So it's a really good investment. Once they get you trained and on systems that fit you well and fit your capacity well, then you won't need them as much. And so you don't need to keep paying all that money all the time. If you don't use a CPA at this point and you set it up yourself and you set it up wrong, then probably what happens is a few years later, you've got really messy financials and you have to pay just as much money out to get it fixed and it's much more disruptive because you're fixing something that you've already been using and you're already sort of in mid flow with all of your programs and funding sources. So what you're going to want from this setup process with the CPA is a, a, it's called a chart of accounts and that's the listing of all the different categories of assets, liabilities, income and expense that you have for your organization. You want this to be a minimal list. All the other things that you may be thinking of in terms of programs and jobs should be handled differently than in the account name. So just for example, office supplies is office supplies. You don't want to have 10 accounts. Office supplies program A, office supplies program B, 
Office Supplies Program A, Funder 1, Office Supplies Program B, Funder 3, that level of complexity where you associate that office supplies with all those different programs and funders, that doesn't happen at the chart of accounts level. That happens at the level where you set up in QuickBooks, it would be classes and jobs. In other programs, it would maybe be called enterprises and funders, but you get the idea. The chart of account should be simple and lean. You, want, you would definitely look at some sample chart of accounts for other nonprofits and see what that looks like. You want to have strategies for keeping the account to a minimum. That's a basic internal control. Nobody's allowed to go in and randomly add accounts because they couldn't figure out where to post their paper clips. And procedures, most importantly, to ensure that your budget categories and your chart of account categories are the same. So as you're sitting down to build your budget for the coming year, that's really the same time you sit down and review your chart of account and you agree with inside the organization on what those categories are going to be, both for the budgeting and for the financial reporting, and there's no daylight between those two. Managerial requirements in a simple QuickBooks environment are mostly going to be met outside of QuickBooks. So the manager needs to have the programs defined, um, and then they'll probably do a lot of their other accounting in Excel. But the manager's job is to make sure that the programs are well-defined, and that should track back to board-level direction. One thing you might think about doing if your programs don't seem crystal clear to you right now is could you, on one page, come up with something called a program charter? Could you define simple statement of purpose for the program, uh, the language that you would use to a funder to describe it? If you can't get that program really simply defined on a piece of paper, maybe it's a project, right? Maybe it's something that goes under a bigger program. And if you're thinking through this right now and you think about your organization, on your left hand, count off the different programs you name for your organization. And now on your right hand, count off the funders, the main organization's funders. If there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one correspondence there, if you think of your programs and your funders as the same, it would be really worthwhile to do this exercise of thinking of a program charter that stands alone, separate from the funder. And then you can think about having multiple funders funding that one program. So the grant and contract reporting, I sort of started here saying, don't, don't build from this level because you need a lot more than what the grants and contracts need. But for sure, you have to give the grant and contract people what they need. But you don't want to do any more at this level than you have to, right? So if you have 10 organizations that fund you, 10 uh, grant-making organizations that fund you, and two of them just give you unrestricted and don't want to see anything but a general overall report for the organization, there's no need for you to set up those two grants and do detailed reporting against them because they didn't ask you to. And it's just extra time and you're paying someone for that time. But the eight others did say they want discrete reporting just against their budget, the budget they approved for you. So you got to do that if you accepted that money, you accepted it with that condition. And so you want to, as soon as you accept that money, set up a system in your accounting system that you can meet that requirement. So again, this is part of being able to crosswalk back and forth between the funding categories that may be in the funder's budget and the funding categories that you have in your chart of accounts. I said this five times, but it's so important because if you, if you let the budget and the accounting system deviate, then you, you just never get back on track for that whole year that the two have, have gone apart. Um, the way to build a budget is from the bottom up. So with a budget, you start with each grant and contract, and then you add the grants and contracts up to come up with the budget for the program. And then you add the programs up to have an overall budget for all your programs. And then administration and development are basically at the same level as programs. So remember, on the IRS 990, they just want to see all programs, all administration, 
and all development. In your budget, you're maybe going to have programs one through five roll up to all programs and then programs administration and development. That roll up level, the top level, is the summary organizational budget for everybody. But you can think now as you walk through this, it's not going to make any mathematical sense at all if it doesn't literally add up from these smallest sub budgets up to the top. That's an entirely an Excel exercise. The budget to actual reports in QuickBooks, for sure, the most efficient way to do it is just to run the profit and loss report for the time period out of QuickBooks into Excel, and then in Excel, match that up with a budget for that time period. More expensive programs have much better mechanisms for doing budget to actual, but that's what I'd said before. It's a more expensive program, and it's going to require more expensive staff time. So the heart and soul of all this is allocation strategies. What makes this complicated is there's all these different programs and activities and funding sources, and you just get one paycheck to run around doing all these different things. And at some point, that paycheck needs to be spread out to all these different categories. So that's salaries. That's where the action is. That's the most important allocation problem. There's other shared direct costs that also need to be allocated, and then there's shared overhead, such as office, office rent, that also needs to be allocated. So to come up with an allocation, the first thing you need to do is have a basis for the allocation. So you can't just say, well, I've heard it's the best practice to only have 25% administrative costs, so I'm just going to allocate 75% to programs and 25% to admin. That's not a good basis for your allocation. So the simple method is to do a selective time study. So you would choose one or two weeks out of the year that are representative weeks, have everybody keep track of their time for those weeks, and use how those percentages play out as the percentages that count for the whole year, as if you were keeping your time for the whole year. That'll probably work in a smaller organization a larger organization that's getting a formal audit from a certified public accountant, that accountant may require you to keep actual time records and to allocate on the basis of the actual time records that the employees keep. Either way, in either of these methods, the trick for the managers is communicating with every staff person the expectations in the budget, right? So the budget is going to have carefully allocated salary across multiple programs and funding sources. If the person in that job then starts doing their job in totally different percentages to how it's funded, you're going to arrive at the end of the year with reports that don't line back to what you were planning on. So that's a conversation between a manager and a supervisor and the staff person to have clear expectations. If you're 30% funded on a certain project, you're really expected to work 30% time on that project. Sure, in any given week or month, you may not at all be 30% time on that project, but by the time it all adds up at the end of the year, it really needs to come in at 30%. Otherwise, you're misappropriating the funder's resources through misappropriating your own time, because your time is the resource. Other basis for allocation would be square feet, so that would be good for office space. And then the catch-all is just any other reasonable method. So I can't give you a good example of another reasonable method right now, but um, the rule is it would have to be reasonable. So if you wanted to use another basis for allocation, that would probably be something that if you had an outside CPA who is auditing your organization, they would have to sign off that they believed that that method was reasonable. So now the mechanics. So first we come up with a basis, right? What are the different percentages? What are they based on? And then you literally have to do a journal entry to move the money from a catch-all category. So for example, when you write, when you run payroll, all the money comes out of your checking account. You probably just put it in a holding payroll expense to be allocated. And then you would do in Excel the calculation of, of how much percentage of that payroll 
is allocated across the different programs and to the different funding sources. And then you would translate that back into your accounting system with what's called a journal entry. These are the things that you're going to really want to buy the more expensive accounting program because it can be automated and do this journal entry way easier. But as I said before, also requires higher capacity. So for many of you, the, the pain of the accounting system will be after you run payroll, putting it into Excel, doing the percentage calculations, creating the journal entry in Excel, and then going and entering the journal entry in QuickBooks. How often do you want to do this? Because it's not much fun. Monthly or quarterly is good. Um, with each payroll is also good. So that's going to have to be a matter of a, sort of a capacity strategy that you'll think through when you're designing the details of your system. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about what we mean by a certified public accountant and an audit. So a certified public accountant is licensed by the state where they operate. And what that license means is that they can conduct a financial audit, which means that they would examine your transactions using generally accepted auditing standards. And on the basis of that examination under generally accepted auditing standards, they may attest to the public in a written letter using formal language that your financial statements accurately reflect the underlying transactions in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. That's all very formal, locked-in language. That's what it means to be a CPA is you are someone who can do that. CPAs can do lots of other things as well, but the license is saying that they can do this thing in particular that other people cannot do. Other people may have just as much knowledge and training, but they don't have the license. So when they say, I think your financial statements are accurate, it doesn't mean anything. When a CPA uses the formal language that they've done this formal audit and they've declared your financial statements good, that's what the license represents. And that's what a financial audit is. Alternatives, cost savings alternatives. So an audit is a long, painful process. It's a great best practice, but it's not really a best practice if you really don't need one and it's tying up a lot of staff time and costing you a lot of money. So very, very, very appropriate for a smaller organization to have a frank conversation with the board and make sure that the board isn't requiring an audit just because they don't know they have alternatives and just because they think that it's like safe from their perspective as a board member, but at the same time, maybe not actually the best use of the organization's resources. An outside certified public accountant can do what's called a review, which is they're still gonna take a long, hard look at your records and probably provide you with lots of advice and give you nice financial statements, but it won't cost you nearly as much as an audit because they don't actually test the underlying transactions for accuracy. And then the lowest level of service would be a compilation. And in that case, they really take you at your word when you present your year and numbers, but they do the basic adjustments that are very standard and obvious from their perspective. And they present your financial statements in a form that is uh, more closely aligned to generally accepted accounting principles than probably what you would have done yourself internally. So, the most important thing I'm talking about here when I talk about the lowest level of a compilation and what they would do versus what you could do usually has to do with what's called temporarily restricted net assets. So when a donor gives you a donate, let's say they give you $100,000 and they say that this $100,000 may only be used for program A and I don't want to see any of it going to program B and I don't want to see any of it go to general admin. I only want my $100,000 to go to program A. That $100,000 is temporarily restricted for program A. The other thing a donor could do is they could write you a $100,000 check and say, this is totally general support, but I'm writing you the check on December 31st and you're a calendar year reporter. So you got the $100,000 on December 31st. By definition, they wanted you to spend it the next year, right? It's not possible for you to spend $100,000 in six hours on New Year's Eve. That money is temporarily restricted 
for the coming year. And of course, you could have both kinds of restrictions on a donation that was made to the organization. How you're going to report that in any normal situation in QuickBooks and in your normal internal accounting is not going to line up with a very formal and rather complicated outside accounting, generally accepted accounting principles way that you present temporarily restricted on an income statement. So if you have these temporarily restricted types of income, it's super helpful to have a CPA at least at the end of the year come and do the formal presentation on the income statement. On the balance sheet, what the board is going to be looking for and what you want the accountant to help you think through is at the end of the year, you're going to see how much of the organization's net assets should be temporarily restricted at the end of the year. And then you're going to compare that to how much cash or accounts receivable the organization has on hand. And if the organization, let's just say the organization has $100,000 as temporarily restricted for next year. It better have $100,000 either of cash or accounts receivable to match that, or it means by definition, the organization has already, as I like to say, dipped its hands in the TR cookie jar, right? It was dipping its hands in the cookie jar where the TR money was before it was supposed to. So the balance sheet presentation is very important because you don't want to be in that situation. And the board doesn't want to see financials that shows that you're in that situation. So this is important year-end stuff that you want a CPA to help you with. Program accounting, so back to the managerial accounting side. Um, from the program accounting side, you're concerned with program costs overall. Can you support this program? Or is this program just never going to make it? Or do you need to really ramp up the fundraising? And with allocation strategies. The other big part of managerial accounting is cash flow budgeting. This is critical for most small nonprofits, and I think if you understood what I said a minute before about temporarily restricted funds, this is where the problems happen. So you have $100,000 restricted to program A, but program B isn't going to be able to make payroll next week, and so you use the funds that were restricted from program A to meet payroll for program B. You're really not supposed to do that. So how do you plan so that you're never in a situation where that would happen? So a simplified projection of cash flow budget, beginning cash plus expected cash in minus expected cash out is your predicted ending cash. This is not complicated, but you have to do it. And you have to do it on a month by month basis in most cases to see if you're running into a problem and if you're about to incur obligations and expenses this month that are going to cause you to be in a bad cash situation six months out or if you've got enough time to make better decisions sooner. Often you will need a line of credit. Nonprofits can get lines of credit and you should really think about applying for it before you need it and you can develop credit and so you should think about even if you don't think you need credit, wouldn't it be awesome for your organization to have good credit so that if you needed credit, you could get it? And realize that a cash flow crisis, and probably many of you on the phone, has been in environments where um, you just took it for a given that the nonprofit was in a constant cash flow crisis. Here's my strong editorial towards the end of this presentation because I can't go this long without a strong editorial. There's no such thing as a cash flow crisis that wasn't created by a bad manager. It's a manageable problem. It's part of what you're supposed to do as a manager is look into the future and make decisions to avoid that cash flow crisis. You don't ever, ever, ever want to have to give someone a pink slip on Friday and tell them they can't come back to work on Monday because you wouldn't be able to make payroll. If you're going to have to lay someone off you really want to know that you've got a good six-week window before you have to make that decision. So this kind of goes back to the ethics things we talked about last week, right? Good financial stewardship means not letting yourself get into a crisis management situation. And that means really, really keeping an eye on your cash flow budgeting. 
So for the managers and board, they're going to be looking at the budget to actual profit and loss or income statements. As I mentioned before, that'll usually be done in Excel, and that'll be a combination of the report you'll put out of QuickBooks and the budget that you have in Excel. So here's the wrap up before we go over to Zoom and talk it out. Uh, what you want to do, first of all, is define your needs. Define them completely so you can define a system that meets your needs. And then design and implement a system that meets all of your needs in the most efficient, cost-effective way. And then you've got to do a ton of training and you've got to do constant training and constantly be supporting and empowering everyone in the organization to um, have some familiarity with the language of the budget and for sure to have respect for the importance and the centrality of the budget and financial process. You don't want to be in an organization where anyone would ever speak dismissively of the need of the bookkeeping department. That should just be a given that that's just not part of organizational culture, that that uh, role is respected and understood as supporting everything in the organization. If you put financial management at the center of the organization, it's going to work out. You will figure out how to get the right tools, and you'll have a strong and ethical organization. Here's my preview for next week. So next week, we're going to be finally down to the nittiest, grittiest details. Um, and and we, we may, there will be something in next week for everyone, for sure. And there will also be some things in next week that may not apply to everybody. We'll talk about special accounting requirements for federal awards that may be well up beyond where some of you are, but it's probably where most of you are going. So when you understand some of those additional requirements, you'll understand the importance of uh, building in that capacity from the beginning so that when you get to federal awards, you're capable of administering them. We're going to talk about the 1023, which is your application for nonprofit status, and the 990, which is your federal tax return. We're going to talk about how those are public documents and what the public gets from them and why you want to really control the narrative around those documents and how you use them as public documents. We're going to talk about unrelated business income tax. I think it will surprise some of you that uh, there are a lot of nonprofits out there that engage in farming activities that might be subject to the unrelated business income tax. It's not scary. It's just another level of complexity that you need to absorb, but it shouldn't be a big deal. What you don't want to do is ignore it and then have the IRS come tell you about it. We'll talk about private inurement, which is directly an ethics issue, but we'll give examples of um, how you might think it's not an unethical thing, but according to the letter of the law, it could have been private adjournment. So you can have procedures in place to never have the perception of private enrollment, certainly not the reality of it. Um, and then we'll look at a case study um, on the coalition of Immokalee farm workers and what recently happened to them with discrepancies between what was reported on their 1023 and 990 and what they were doing <clears throat> and why that got them in trouble. And that will be our motivation for why you want to do a good job on your 1023s and 990s. 